I'm Kevin Falvey, Editor-in-Chief of Boating Magazine. Welcome to the webinar. In this episode, we're going to have Peter Nolet joining us from IMTRA. Peter, tell us a little bit about yourself. Say hello. Hi there, Kevin. How are you today? Great, man. Thanks for joining us. Give us a 30-second spin about yourself. 30-second, but a long-time IMTRA employee, love the outdoors, grew up a little bit on boats, and but uh, spent a lot of time on outdoor sports in general. That's great. Peter is the brand manager for thrusters for IMTRA, and today we're going to talk be talking about uh, bow thrusters, stern thrusters, how to integrate them with your existing uh, propulsion systems, and all kinds of stuff thruster related. Actually, Peter and I got together and had an in-depth discussion last week that we've recorded, and we're going to have you guys view it. And then following that, Peter will be available. It's a few minutes. Watch it. Maybe runs eight or 10 minutes. Check it out. And then Peter will be live, back here live with us to answer your questions directly. So I guess uh, without any further ado, we can go to the videotape. Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Falby, Editor-in-Chief of Boating Magazine. And today I'm here with Peter Nolet, Brand Manager for Thrusters for Intra. Peter, good afternoon. How are you today, Kevin? Good to, good to talk to you. Good to talk to you. We're going to talk about thrusters today. Peter's going to share his experience, expertise, and knowledge about thrusters and about integrating thrusters with joysticks. Peter, let's start right off with that big word, big phrase, joystick integration. What the heck is it? And why do I want it? The joysticks are really cool in that they automatically will join in your main propulsion you know, with a bow thruster or a bow and stern thruster, uh, depending on the version. And it's software driven to join the two systems together. And basically the main propulsion side is, is who has the joysticks. Bubble started with the joysticks and everyone kind of went that, that way and everyone's got one now, whether you're a gearbox or engine guy. So it didn't make sense for us to have our own. And we felt more, it made more sense to partner with everybody. So that's what we've been doing since 2012 uh, with our proportional systems. And so basically it's just a matter of the size of the boat uh, on the thrusters that we're putting on to balance with the engines or propulsion side, uh, such that this one single joystick for the operator allows them to move the whole boat in close quarter maneuvering very simply, I want to go in a vector, or a, and it does it automatically for you. And it's nice and smooth and, and quiet is the nice thing. Tell us about the different types of thrusters. If I'm a boater, you know, IMTRA offers a variety of thrusters, some bow thrusters, stern thrusters. Give us a short tutorial of what they are and why I want them. Okay, so, you know, thrusters are what make the boat go sideways. And we have lots of different types. So we have about 169 different models or so uh, because we do... AC power, DC power, and hydraulic. And we do everything from a 20-foot boat up to, say, a 150-foot vessel because uh, we do commercial stuff also. So, you know, basically, we have a thruster. Any boat in that size range, we have the product that'll, that'll kind of suit the purpose. It's all a matter of maybe what the expectations are for the customer um, and or what the job requires. So uh, in the case of the joystick uh, integration, it's all about just matching the right power uh -huh. uh, to balance with the with the main engines or propulsion side. Right. And I guess a lot of people might ask, I just want to address this, is that, you know, the joystick systems up by themselves are a wonderful leap forward in maneuverability, close quarters maneuverability from boats that lack joysticks, mm -hmm. but there's still room for improvement, most certainly, and you know, especially as boats have gotten larger and longer um, and the new outboard boats, which kind of segues into the next thing, you have a large outboard boat, uh, multi-engine outboard boats are very popular nowadays, as we all know. Right. What solutions do you offer for those kind of boats and how do thrusters help in those kind of boats? So it's, you know, it's nice that those, the big engine guys, so Yamaha and Mercury, when they first started doing all these, you know, multiple engine boats, they came up with a joystick already that worked on just the outboards, kind of like Volvo with IPS, okay? They say, you don't need a, you don't need a bow thruster for these systems, but they found that as the center consoles were eclipsing 50 foot, that it was asking a lot for the power at the stern to control the bow. So they were looking for an assist in their joystick systems and a bow thruster made the most sense. So they reached out to us a couple of years ago um, and we've been working with them. They just launched at Miami show this past year, uh, OEMs first, 
uh, integration with a bow thruster. And then probably next year after pandemic, you know, pandemic times are challenging for all of us a little bit, but um, as they move forward, they are going to be launching this for recreational boats also. Now the joysticks, you know, there's, there's inexpensive ones out there that just work off an on-off thruster where you're full power on and off. And those systems aren't as smooth uh, or as quiet because you're full power on and off on the bow thruster. So you can imagine it's a little, can be a little jumpy versus newer systems are nothing but proportional thrusters, okay? Uh -huh. And um, and so moving forward, that's that's the best system because you're only applying the power you need relative to the conditions. So how does that work? The software let like the, the the more I push the joystick, the more power I get. I mean, let's let's exactly it's all in the here. it's all in the software. So like in the case of Mercury, um, they know what our performance is zero to hundred percent, and in terms of balancing, it works like it actually works out the yaw. So as the bow to keep the bow level or with the stern, they use the thruster to increase that performance. So it's pretty cool how the systems work. Um, but again, it's it's why Mercury is launched and, and Volvo IPS was last year adding mm -hmm. a bow thruster into their systems. Right. So any any existing recreational boaters, I know I've reached out a few people that I know that had IPS boats that were like, yeah, I can add a thruster now because before you could add a thruster, but it would have no integration of your standalone item. So now building it in the same joystick, it's one control to make all those maneuvers automatically, which is really nice. Oh, that's pretty huge. Yes, yeah. you're not manning two, two different sets of controls to operate. Right. You're just trying to move the boat, get the boat to do what you want, Correct. instead of worrying about what this device is doing and what this device is doing. Right, right. And for you know, for the novice boater, you know, or for someone that's not super experienced, it really makes their life so much easier. You know, and and part of the challenge we have in boating is people want to get in and go. They don't necessarily want to take the time to to learn how to use their boat in all those conditions. Right. So having the improved maneuverability really makes uh, their life much better. And, you know, the cost difference on these joysticks can vary quite a bit. So they go from, you know, inexpensive ones might be $6,000 mm -hmm. and really expensive ones might be $15,000. It just depends where they fall. Overall, the cost of those, it's like most things that are new. The cost is yeah. coming down a little bit. And certainly as there's more competition on those products too. So. Right. Again, Mercury was the first on the outboard guys and just, just doing it, whereas every other engine shaft drive, you know, inboard engine guy or gearbox guy is at a joystick. So, and they follow along very quickly. So we would hope that other outboard guys will follow along after, which is really getting exciting for the industry, I think. Right. I just want to make one comment, Peter, uh, about the beginner boat or the novice boat or absolutely um, anything that aids in maneuverability is certainly, I'm sure, really desirable. But for an, as an experienced boater, I'll go on record and say that, you know, I love having aids to maneuverability. Uh, there's definitely situations. I look at it as tools in a box. You know, if my toolbox is full, I can get the job done better and probably easier. It's not that I can't get the job done another way, but I can get it done easier. So it's a wonderful convenience. And, you know, we go out to, on our boats to enjoy ourselves. And uh, anything that can enhance that enjoyment and make the day go easier is, you know, I'm all in. Yeah, you don't want to spend a great day in the water, and then you come back to the dock, and in, in half an hour, it can kill the whole day if you have a bad docking experience. So it's really nice if we can make that such that, you know, the customer has a good day overall, you know? So towards that end, suppose I already have a boat. I'm not starting new. I'm not buying a new boat. Not fortunate enough to buying a new, you know, <laughs> thruster-equipped boat today with a joystick. Right. But I have a pair of engines or triple engines and a, and a, and a, or more, and I've got a joystick system aboard. Can I retrofit my boat? Sure. So thrusters absolutely refitable on almost any boat. You know, um, it, it's a lot of different solution sizes, such that we're we're able to fit them on every any boat that's out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Interested distributor for Schleipner for all North America, and we have a dealer installer network all around North America, including the Caribbean, such that if you got a used boat and you'd like to have a thruster installed, we usually have a dealer you know in place close by. Uh, we also have mobile guys that can travel around. So usually we can take care of the customers pretty easily. Um, right. They'll fall back to us in terms of helping spec the system, that kind of thing, possibly. But they're usually pretty good. So Now tell us about, you have a, we had a preliminary discussion. You mentioned uh, the external thrusters. Uh, and tell us a little bit about the application of those and what the advantage is and what, tell, tell us what that's all about. Schleipner started with their own for, for twin stern drives some time ago. And then there was a company out of Austria called Extern. Um, mm -hmm. They came up with like a pod 
that was mounted for, it was really designed for slow boats, not a planing boat, uh, sailboats, that kind of thing. Schleitner, um, because we were already doing the stern drive product, they bought the company in Austria. They redesigned the product a couple of years ago to a very cool bolt-on external product. So it's very easy to install and it's perfect for the outboard boats because it installs very low on the transom. You get the tunnel part below your harmonic uh, plate on your outboards. So it's one of the only thrusters that really works on an outboard powered boat. And um, same thing, we do it as a double for the bow thruster on a slow boat. Um, but those externals are not great on the bow. You don't want an exposed external thruster on a bow of a planing boat crashing in waves. Not a great thing. That's where a tunnel thruster comes into play. But on the sterns on these boats, the external is great because very inexpensive, easy to add to a boat. If you want total control, say you already have a bow thruster, and now I want to add a stern thruster. Well, now you've got that total control of the boat, maybe without having a joystick system. Right. So it, there's other ways around it to give more maneuverability. And what about if I have a single engine? Are there any, are there, I mean, a single engine boat, is there, is there an opportunity for me with thrusters? Yeah, so right now the thruster part is easy. We got you covered there and we can do bow and stern. In terms of the joystick systems, they haven't launched anything for a single engine outboard boat yet. So that, now this is a wonderful, there's a whole bunch of permutations here. Thrusters, joysticks, bow thruster, stern thruster, various pricing. Is there a resource? that people can like preliminarily like take a look at and see what kind of box or category they fit in? So we did a really good article in our content learning center on our website. We, we established a new uh, segment. We've got a YouTube channel also, but on our content learning is where we have some really good articles and video. And right. we did one on basically thruster costing. So okay. it goes through kind of A to Z on costing. And that's it. That's a, a spinoff of our website. So it's www.imter.com backslash learning center. Tell me about powering thrusters. Now, you know, I, I've heard hydraulic uh, is great and electric is maybe not as great, but that could be wrong. Teach me about electric versus hydraulic for thrusters. Yeah, so so the, the, the key difference, what hydraulic offers you is unlimited runtime. And really that's, that's really it. You know, 100 kilo thrust hydraulic and 100 kilo thrust DC unit are the same the, in terms of performance. The only difference is how long you can run them. Okay, so a hydraulic, as long as I'm cooling it, can run unlimited forever, 24 um, seven. DC, because of the, the motor, you're gonna have heat generation. So it's gonna have a, a finite runtime based on that heat generation. And of course, everything's got thermal protection, so you're not damaging anything, but you do have a finite runtime. Now, the, the advantage of proportional control is huge. You know, single speed just on off thrusters is full power on and off, very hard on the equipment. But proportional thrusters now allows us it to upsize the thruster a little bit, create a really good throttle range of operation that's less than 100% and increase that runtime. So if, you're, if your throttle range is less than 100%, you're gonna get really long runtime. And that's our goal on the joystick systems, especially. We try to target a product that's gonna provide really long runtime. And we also have a cool feature on those proportional products for extended runtime, which automatically reduces performance to reduce your, your heat generation to give you longer time overall running, okay? In the case of some of the joysticks, you don't need 100% performance. You only need a little bit in terms of balance with the engine. So a lot of times right. those joysticks give you a long run time anyways. Yeah, because the joystick systems do work. I mean, it's not like they're, they, they, they work great. They work great, I should say, but it's yep. not, it's like anything else. And now you have this complimentary thing you have, you can get to a, an even higher place of maneuverability. Right, right. I mean, the difference is, so outboard power boats, we're never going to do hydraulics. It's very, it'd be, you know, very unlikely we're going to have a power source for a hydraulic pump. We need a mechanical right. power source. So very unlikely on those boats. The times that we really get into the hydraulic joystick systems are when we're in the big sport fish boats that want to do uh, bottom fishing. And they don't want to drop a hook. They just want to push a button, station hold, stay over my spot. And that's where the station holding rig comes into play, but they could be there for quite a while. So in right. those regards, we want hydraulic thrusters and we want them to be able to run 24 seven if they want to. Right. So that's where the difference is really, but on the smaller recreational boats, DC thrusters are certainly fine and have the runtime that most people need. So it's usually not a problem. Oh, that's great. So now in our uh, pre-video meeting, you, you, didn't, you mentioned some stuff about some auxiliary functions that having a thruster provides that with the control box and a display, et cetera. Can you describe some of that for our audience? With our systems, one of the first things we decided with our proportional systems was we wanted a screen on our control panel at the helm to give feedback of what's going on with the thruster buried in your bilge. 
you know? And so we have a small little screen on our proportional panels that gives you real-time feedback of your runtime. So you never, you never without knowing how much you got left in terms of your runtime. So you're not gonna get stuck in an operation where all of a sudden the thruster stops running for your thermal shutdown. Right. Um, and then you're stuck because on those joystick systems, if one part of that equation is out, you thrust or one engine, the mm. system doesn't work. OK, mm. so so you really want to have that part working and working properly. So, again, the feedback's really good because, you know, boating, as we all know, if you can plan on something, you're in great shape. It's the surprises that are really the problem. So so that's one thing. And then the other thing is we built a hold function into our into our panels. And this was really for the dock side use. And it, it was in mind for a guy that you want to single hand a 50 foot yacht. So now you can come down to the boat, turn your bow and stern thruster on, pin it to the dock, untie the boat yourself, back on board and away you go. So with bow and stern and that hold function, you can single hand a bigger yacht without a problem. Or, you know, you take a boat out without limited, without uh, experienced crew. You know, you can go out with just friends that really have never been on a boat. You don't have to worry about, hey, you know, do this, do that. You know, you know how much you don't want those folks helping because they, they exactly might get right. hurt. They don't, they, no, they just don't know what they're doing. True. It's kind of nice. The liver boys really like it, you know, so uh, it's been a really it's been a really nice feature as part of that system we introduced back in 2012. Before we close, is there anything you think we haven't covered or anything you'd like to add about thrusters or or interim in particular? I think uh, I think we covered most of at least these two topics. I could talk all day probably, but yeah, we have we certainly have other products. If you visit our website, the Content Learning, you might be able to see those because you know certainly we have a number of premium products for yachts. So, all right, Peter. Well, thanks for sharing your knowledge today for us about thrusters. Uh, Peter Nolet, product manager for Imtra, and uh, stick around because there's going to be a live session right after this video if you're watching it on its first airing. If not. That live uh, stream video with uh, reader and viewer questions uh, will be archived as well. You may be watching it that way. At any rate, we're going live in just a minute, and we'll see you then. Well, hey, everybody, we're back. Peter, that was a great presentation. I lived through it live, watched it through editing, and saw it again today. You did a great job, sir. Your knowledge is vast, and uh, you're good at explaining it. Uh, I hope some of our... Uh, viewers and our audience here today will have some good questions for you. Um, kicking it off, we have John from Luz, Delaware wants to ask, what's involved with converting my on-off bow thruster to a proportional thruster that could integrate with my boat's joystick system? So it's a pretty simple process we have now, Kevin. We've been, we had a program, um, we had to develop a program for this because it became so popular. So we actually have our SEP upgrade program because you can actually do an upgrade on a boat without the boat being out of the water, which is kind of cool. You just need to haul them, take the motors out of the boat or out, off the thruster and return the motors to us. We actually pay the freight to have the motors come back to us. We do the in-house labor for free, and then we ship the motors back to the customer for, for free also. What we charge for is strictly parts used. So we have an upgrade because the motor really is the same motor um, for our, we're just changing the way we control it. So it's real easy for us to upgrade. The biggest change is on the boat itself and the control system. So usually what we'll do is we'll ship um, the control equipment to the, to the dealer and the dealer will ship the motors back to us and then start the process of changing out the control system. So that when we ship the motors back, they can just drop the motors on the boat do a little startup process and be all set. So it, it's an efficient way of doing it. We did have to put a pause in that program this past year relative to some supply problems. So we did put a hold on the program for 2022. Um, we're waiting for an update on a kind of product availability because we hope to reopen that program for 2023. But it's a very simple program. Um, we can do not only our own product being Schleipner thrusters, we can do other brands because you know, for us, an on-off DC thruster is an on-off DC thruster uh, motor, and we can we can upgrade basically anyone's product. Jason Bruchette asks um, if we can talk about what to consider when choosing a single or dual prop thruster. Okay, well, it's all about sizing. So, you know, as far as Schleipner goes, we use the kind of all three propulsion technology. So our smallest thrusters, we have a single prop. Then we transition into twin tandem props with a singular shaft 
spinning both props together. And then on our larger units, we go to twin counter rotating, which is the most efficient way to move the most amount of water in the smallest opening is twin counter rotating. The only reason to do the single props on the small units are to, you know, basically we get enough thrust out of them, but really it's to save money, you know, on a single prop unit really, because you can't move, you can't move the same amount of water in the same opening with a single prop that you can with a twin counter or a twin count, twin tandem. So it's all about using the best technology to move the most water in the smallest opening. So back to the question, it really depends on what that customer has for a boat and then what he wants for, for performance. Now, we do a really cool thing with boat builders and we, we provide thruster calculations because you know a builder has to pick one model of thruster as an option that satisfies everyone. So we wanna have them make the most educated choice in picking that size. So we, do a, we know what our output performance is for our thruster model. So we'll take the boat shape, side profile, plot what the windage is, and then apply our performance, three models, to the boat and show you what we can counter in terms of direct side wind. So, you know, it, it, some customers, you might have two customers that have the same 30 foot boat, but one guy doesn't leave the dock when it's blowing 20, another guy goes out, doesn't care. You know, so their, their need for performance might be totally different. So the thruster calcs are great in representing what we do relative to that boat. And then the customer, again, it's all about, you know, meeting expectations. So as long as we can set the expectations where they are, we can make sure that the customer is very happy. So it's, again, we have a huge database from all the builders now of all these side profiles. So we turn around with this huge database and we use those for the aftermarket. So if we don't have your particular boat, we have something very close in our database that we can represent. So it's really great for the customer to go, oh, that does 20 knots a side wind, that does 22, that does 24, I want that model. And, and where they fall for pricing too. So, you know, it's a great way to make the most educated decision on sizing. Okay, we've got a we've got a question and and Jason, thanks you. And we've got a question now from Don Duncan. He says, I currently have a bow thruster SP155. I assume that's one of yours. Yes. Um, I would like a stern thruster. It, is it important to match the thrust between the two? Depends the boat's shape configuration for balancing. Um, you know, a lot of times we can have a larger stern thruster if you have a lot more mass aft, say, or a lot more windage aft. Um, but generally speaking, most motor yachts, we tend to have same bow and stern for general equal performance. Um, with the proportional product, we have that hold function built in so you can actually tune it so they work perfectly together so the boat moves, you know, perfectly sideways. Um, you get in open water and you set the hold calibration, they come on full, full power, and then you tune them so the boat goes perfectly sideways, you push your hold button to set it, and you're good to go. On-off thruster is a little different because you're balancing relative to trying to pulse it, pulse your thruster in kind of controlled bursts. So, but again, general speaking, you, you have same bow and stern. Certain models of boat, you may be able to get smaller in the stern, maybe. Um, but generally speaking, it's about the same, usually. Okay. All right. I'm sure Don is grateful for that uh, question. Um, now we have uh, Jim. He wants to know, what size thruster should I have for my own 30-foot center console? Again, it's, you know, it's his expectation. What does he want for performance is usually the first question we have for that aftermarket customer. Because, you know, some customers may have a greater expectation for the product than others. So we want to figure out what his expectations are. And then relative to that, we usually have a model that we can suggest that's gonna meet his expectations. Generally speaking, 30 foot center console boat, you're into either our 140 mil tunnel thruster and like 50 kilo thrust or up into a 185 mil and maybe the 60 kilo thrust unit. Um, big difference in tunnel sizes really between you got a five and a half inch and up to a seven and a quarter inch ID tunnel. So that's a kind of a big jump from one to the other. So a lot of times it's a matter of what fits best on the boat. The old, we used to say in the old days, when I first started doing this in the eighties, the best thruster is the one that fits. So the right thruster is the one that fits the boat, you know? Um, rule of thumb is it's, it's what can physically fit, what you can reasonably power and what the budget is. Those are really your three limitations on what you're installing, you know? So um, generally speaking, we can help that customer. We talk to the dealer and we can, we can fine tune it from there on what, what would fit his needs. All right. So we have another question. Steve Schreiber 
Right now I have a bow thruster only. Is there anything I should be aware of if I want to add an external stern thruster? Just balancing with whatever models in his bow in terms of performance. So you don't want to, you know, you wouldn't want a 100, 100 kilo thrust bow thruster and then, you know, go down to a 50 kilo thrust stern thruster. Too big a disparity, you know? So you'd want to try to balance. So you'd want to know what's in his bow and try to match somewhat equal performance. Jim Conlin asks, is there any battery type that's preferred, AGM or lead acid? I guess it means so, front and cell conventional battery versus AGM. Right. Thrusters generally we've migrated to the AGM batteries. And because in the case of a valve thruster, you can get a sealed AGM, so you don't have to worry about the venting. Um, the AGMs are very good because they take a charge quite well. Um, they have cold, good cold crank on a start type battery. Um, the newer things of lithium ion and things are growing, you know, that's a fast growing technology that we're really keeping our finger kind of on the pulse of um, because it, it changes things on a thruster quite a bit because, you know, lithium ion batteries don't have a voltage drop. So, and we thrusters, we plan for a voltage drop. I mean, on a 12 volt thruster, we rate the performance at 10 and a half volts, such that if we've got a lithium ion battery powering it, you're seeing full 12, 12 volts of powering. So it's all, it's going to give you higher performance because you're going to generate more RPM out of the motor. Um, and at a higher voltage, though, it's going to have higher amp draw, which can reduce your runtime. So that's something we want to be cognizant of and make sure that we're discussing with that customer in terms of how he's powering and, and what's the best solutions there. But that's the new thing is, and that's a growing technology that, again, it's happening fast. Look at how fast things have changed for everybody in the past 10 years. Um, we expect to see similar in terms of battery changing and that side of things in the next five, probably. That'll be that'll be exciting for all of us, but certainly we gotta we gotta pay attention to. Right, right. How about some maintenance questions? You up for well, maintenance, uh, little maintenance, like ownership issues. Okay, we've talked yeah, about there you go. <laughs> maybe some ownership. What do I have to do to you know a year, six months, a year, two years down the road? What's involved? Thruster maintenance is pretty simple for the most part. I mean, in general, all of us, you know, you, you have anodes that you have to replace on an annual basis. Faster if you're in an area like a hot harbor or something where you see anodes erode faster. Um, we did switch to aluminum alloy anodes back in 2010 um, because it's a much higher performing anode. It works not only in salt water, it works in brackish and fresh water also. So it's a very good anode. Um, it, it started commercial, commercial industry switched over to those years ago. So, you know, it was setting the basis for, for us to make that switch. So we made the, you know, it's 12 years, 12 years now that we made that change and uh, we're not looking back. The nice thing, the aluminum alloy anodes are lighter than zinc. So when you have them on a nose of, of a propeller, it helps that propeller come up to speed faster and slow down faster. So there's a benefit to the lighter weight, weight of our anodes also. Uh, other than that, you're, man, you're watching for you know, check connections. You want to make sure everything's tight. You don't want loose connections on a thruster because those would produce uh, specific heating and, and uh, problems. So you want to make sure, you know, beginning of the season, you've got good tight connections, check them regularly. Um, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. We've gone to seal gear legs across the board unless we're in our larger thrusters. So you know, unless you have an older product that's an oil-fed gear leg where you have to just monitor your oil inside, and, and the oil doesn't go away. That's to provide an internal oil pressure for your gear leg to offset the water pressure and longevity of your seals. So the only thing you're doing there is just making sure you have maintaining your level in your bottle. Um, they say every three years or so is when you replace the oil in those older oil-fed gear legs. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, it's really about it. Uh, older units with the uh, brush dust, that kind of thing, because Series 1 motors are the popular thrusters in the past. We say when you're breaking in your brushes, brushes, use that first year as kind of break-in period. Pull the motor from the boat, blow it out with high-pressure air, put a mask on, blow it out with high-pressure air, clean out that carbon dust, um, because it, it can kill the efficiency of those DC motors. You don't want that to build up, because that's when you see it exhausting and coating that compartment, is if you let it go. So first thing is to clean it out and then just monitor it over its life. And that's about it. It's pretty straightforward on a thruster and obviously battery power. You're going to check battery power beginning of the season and kind of monitor it as you charge. So again, pretty simple stuff for a thrust. Thanks, Peter. So folks, this entire uh, presentation is going to be archived and available on our website. 
and you can review it in the future and you can reach out to Imtra directly, probably get Peter on the phone if you tried and uh, uh, have your questions answered. So we'll give you another minute maybe here. Peter, is there anything we might you might wanna say to our boating audience um, while they're formulating possibly their last questions? Uh, we talk about maintenance. The only other thing I left out was anti-fouling. Okay. So, you know, a thruster is below water line, tunnel thruster in a tunnel. So you wanna treat, you know, if it's a boat that's, you know, these center console boats that live on lifts where you don't bottom paint, you're not too worried about, you know, treating the gear leg prop, that kind of thing. But if the boat's living in the water, you certainly wanna anti-foul your gear leg and your prop or, or props uh, if you get more than one. And the inside your tunnel, same way you treat that like you would your bottom of your hull. Uh, on our website, we have a, an older, um, cause we're not paint experts. So we reached out to Interlux back you know, years ago, and they gave us their recommendation on our bronze gear leg and our composite props. They're, uh, they're fiberglass reinforced props, so they're very strong, uh, but they're different in how you treat those versus the bronze gear leg. So we have their recommendation on our website. It's an older one, meaning the products have changed from them, but the, but the method that you use is still the same. And same for whether well, another brand of, of paint, he's gonna, they're gonna have their own method similar but their own products. So again, you just want to follow along. And of course you want to make sure that you do anti-follow because you don't want to have growth build up uh, on the prop, especially uh, you build up growth, you lose 25% performance really quickly. So pretty important anti-follow. I guess we've been so comprehensive. You have been so good that you have <laughs> answered the world's questions about thrusters, at least for today. Right. So, again, so again, folks, we're going to, we're going to say, look for the archive version of this. Uh, reach out to Imtra directly. There's links available. And uh, I thank you for joining us today. Until next time, this is Kevin Falvey with Peter from Imtra. And this has been Boating Roundtable. Thank you for joining us.